Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of The Art of Photography. My name is Ted Forbes and today we're gonna do our color development. And actually I'm really excited because I actually did this filming a little backwards and I've already done my development and I'm going to play that back for you now with some commentary. Um, I, you know, the last episode that we did, uh, we did a little intro to color film development and I mentioned that I have years of experience doing black and white personally, but I've never done color. So this was kind of a learning experience as I, you know, filmed it and went along with you guys as well. And I had asked for some comments in that episode from people who have done black, or sorry, done color C41 film before. And the response was really overwhelming and it's really cool. There's some great tips that people have in there and I really appreciate it if you left a comment. There's some really wonderful stuff. And go read those. Um, it can seem a little overwhelming and intense, but just I can tell you that those of us that are photographers who do processing and the chemistry side of things, we tend to get a little bit anal retentive. And don't be afraid. Don't let that set you off. Just use it as tips to get you going. Um, you know, if you get stuck and something's wrong, this is great text to go through and you can kind of figure out in the process maybe where something went wrong. There really isn't much to be afraid of. If you have experience developing film, it's a lot easier than black and white. Um, that's my initial impression. The chemicals are a little easier to mix up and deal with. Um, the agitation is more straightforward. There's less options that you have, and that's just the nature of C41 film. And so if you've never developed film before, I actually at this point would probably recommend you try color first and then do black and white second. Black and white is much more involved and there's different options you have and you can get different looks doing different things. And But C41 is very straightforward and it's very easy. So what I have done since the last episode is I went ahead and I ordered everything online and I'm going to revise the shopping list a little bit because there's a couple things you probably don't need in there and I may have left off a thing or two that you do. So I will revise that as I put up this episode. So check the last video for that stuff. Um, the other thing is I ordered my Tetanol kit and um, I also got in, uh, I went ahead and got that in the mail and I also I had two rolls of uh, Kodak Ektar 100 lying around. It's a wonderful color film, shoots at ISO 100. And I went out yesterday and just spent an hour just shooting around here and I took one camera and one lens. And so neither here nor there for this, um, film is film, but I used my Nikon F3, um, which isn't the greatest metering in the world, but I just used the metering built in and I used, uh, you know, know, my 105, 2.5, um, 105 millimeter lens, which is one of my favorite little setups. So I just did one lens, one camera. It kind of forced me just to focus and get some stuff done. I shot two rolls in an hour. Um, if I had lost the images, uh, it wouldn't have been a big deal, but I wanted to take it kind of seriously because I am going to show them to you at the end of this episode. So anyway, without further ado, let's get into the process and let's see exactly how you develop C41 color film. Okay, so in the last week, I went ahead and I got all my supplies and chemicals from mostly from B&H, but I ordered a couple things on Amazon as well. And I want to go through and just talk about what we use in here. A couple of these are optional and uh, you'll see me as I'm using them, but just, you know, so if you want to see what all I got to do this. On the left hand side of the screen towards the back, you see the black tank with the red ring around the lid and that is the Patterson tank and it's got the Patterson spools in there. And that's what you actually put your film into that's going to, where you're going to do all your development. We'll come back to that in a second. In the front, you see the box of DuraSkin rubber gloves. I did not end up using these um, on this particular deal, but uh, if you have sensitive skin or you're a little bit messier when you work. Uh, not a bad idea if you want to protect your hands. Good idea to use. Uh, behind that you see the funnel. The funnel is pretty much required. Um, it's going to make life much easier when you're mixing chemicals, uh, when we have to put all this stuff together. And then also later in the development process when you pour chemicals back into a tank, um, it keeps that a lot needy, neater and tidier than it would if you didn't have it. Um, so it's essential. Anyway, behind that you have the four amber bottles. And we use amber bottles because they're going to protect the chemicals from from light and uh, it's a nice way to store darkroom chemicals in general and so I went ahead and got four of those technically you only need three but um, I went ahead and got a fourth because I'll use it for something I'm sure um, to the right of that you see the two cardboard boxes those are the tetanol chemical kits for our c41 process so we're going to mix those up in a second and in the front you have the film squeegee which in this shot is still in the package in the middle there's a thermometer I ended up using a different one that I had just because it was easier to stick into a bottle and leave there and you'll see that in a second but the thermometer is essential for this and then and to just the left of that, there's a little, you know, black plastic stir stick. And I did not end up using this on any of these, mainly because it wouldn't fit in the bottle. And I, you know, yeah, you, you just don't need it. Um, the chemicals were easy enough to mix uh, without using that. So let's go ahead and talk about the Tetanol C41 kits. And I went ahead and I got two of these. Now, each one of these kits, when you mix up all the chemicals, is capable of developing about eight rolls of 35 millimeter film before you exhaust it. And so that's why I went ahead and got two, because I might want to do more rolls than just 
than the initial eight. And, you know, you can always order more. And like I said, when you have your initial setup going, um, once you have that, this is all you need to buy to do your processing, this and film. And these cost about $27 or so per kit. And uh, it's not too bad. I mean, that averages out to probably what you'd pay at a lab anyway. Um, you know, you're doing it yourself now. It's easy to do. And uh, I thought they were a fairly good deal. Inside each one, you're going to have basically a set of instructions. And the instructions are very easy. They tell you how to mix all your chemicals. And they also tell you your development times, processing times, agitation, all that. And what I'm doing in this video, I pretty much went with that. Um, next, we have the, the silver containers that contain the powder chemicals that we're going to have to mix into liquids. And so you have your developer. And then you also have, now it mixes the bleach and the fix into one solution, which we refer to as a Blix. And there are two parts to this. There's part A and part B. And what you're going to end up doing is these all mix together into one bottle for your Blix stage of development. Now I want to talk about the stuff I got off of Amazon real quick. And basically what we got was we got the large dish tub and we got this fish tank aquarium heater. The fish tank aquarium heater, um, I didn't end up using and I don't recommend really that you get that. First of all, the hottest it gets is about 97 degrees and we need to be up to 102. It did work. It worked consistently. There is a method if you change your development times where you can develop it, you know, as low as 87 degrees Fahrenheit. And so I just didn't use it here. So if, if that could be something that somebody might be interested in, but just to let you know that this was a purchase that I really didn't need to make. Um, I did not end up using it, even though I mentioned it in the last video. But you do need the tub, and that's the important part. I also mentioned we're using the Patterson tank, and the Patterson tank is great because it's got this inner lid that is light proof. So you can put that on, it allows you to pour chemicals in and out of the tank, uh, do your agitation, all that good stuff, and it does not let light in. So it leaves your film in complete darkness. The Patterson tank also uses this particular kit, it comes with two spools, and I really like these spools. This is a really easy thing to use. Just make sure that everything is dry. So if you're reusing, you're doing a second batch, uh, it's hard to get film on if these are wet. But as long as they're dry, basically, Basically, you can expand these to various film types by just kind of twisting the collar. And, you know, you can put anything from 35 millimeter to medium format film in here. And they're very versatile. Uh, it's just a matter of you got to put your film on here and you just kind of turn it from the from the right side clockwise. And it just starts walking the film onto the spool. It's really easy to use. So with all my stuff assembled, um, I did get an apron for this just so I don't get chemicals on my clothes. So I'm about ready to go. So again, if you practice getting rolls of film on the Patterson tanks and you know what you're doing, it's time to use the dark bag, which is like a basically a windbreaker is what it looks like with a double seal in it. And you stick your hands in the sides and then you're ready to start putting your film on your reels and getting it all ready. Once you have everything in the Patterson tank and at least that daylight seal is in, then you're ready to pull that out and start your development. So the first thing that we need to do is go ahead and get the chemicals mixed. And you're going to get powder in each of these packets, and the instructions are in the box, and it's very straightforward to do. Uh, basically, you're going to do these in the hottest tap water that you, you can use. So I, what I did is I turned the tap on full over to the hot side, let it warm up. And in the meantime, I went ahead and labeled my bottles. And this is really important because they do look alike. And if you forget which one the developer is, and it's very easy to do, um, I just put D for developer, B for Blix, and S for stabilizer. So I know what's going on in these. And once the water's heated up, we're ready to start uh, mixing our chemicals. The developer is very straightforward to mix. Basically, you need 800 milliliters of water. Um, I just use the hot tap water, and you go ahead and put it in the bottle, and you're going to add the powder to this. Um, it says stir continuously as you go, but the lip of this bottle is pretty small. I could not stir with it, so just putting the lid on and uh, agitating a little bit and shaking it up. And I noticed that this actually dissolved a lot quicker than a lot of my black and white chemicals do, which take a lot of shaking and, and uh, dissolving to get them actually into a complete liquid. Now, as I mentioned before, the Blix actually comes with two separate solutions. There's solution A and solution B. What you're going to do is put the water in the tank first. This is just as the directions go in the package. You're going to mix in solution A, and once that is mixed in, you're going to put in solution B. Now, one thing that kind of snuck up on me is when you do solution B, as the instructions say, the, the uh, adding Blix powder to water creates an endothermic reaction as it goes into the solution, which means it will get warm. The other thing it means is it's like mixing on the soda streams sometimes and if you pour it in too quickly you're going to have this problem that I had where it burps back up on you. So just make sure when you get to solution B you go real slow and you're real careful. Um, I didn't lose enough chemical to make a difference. The develop still worked um, but just be ready for that to happen so you don't make a huge mess. Also note that I'm doing all of this in the sink so if I do have a spill um, it's not the end of the world. 
Then I mix in my stabilizer, and just like all the other steps here, you basically put your water in first, and you're gonna mix your powder into that, and you should be good to go. Okay, so one thing I wanna mention here is, is I wanna talk about temperature, and I mentioned that I did not use that aquarium heater. And the main reason is, is it would not go up to 102 Fahrenheit, which the instructions in the kit, that's what it recommends. Um, so another thing you can do that actually is very easy to do rather than mess around with an aquarium heater. Um, here's the deal, they're basically three stages. You have your developer, you're gonna do a pre-soak, you have your developer, your Blix, and your wash. The developer needs to be done for three and a half minutes at 102 Fahrenheit or that's 39 Celsius, the Blix can be a little bit cooler. So as you're working, it's okay if your chemicals cool down a little bit. They're not gonna cool fast enough if you're doing these in order. So basically your development needs to be at 39C, 102F, or the Blix needs to be between 95 and 105 Fahrenheit, and that is 35 degrees to 40 and a half Celsius. And so that can cool down, it's okay. And then finally your wash can happen also at a at that range, which is just running tap water, um, which might be a reason to use this fourth amber jar just to use water. So when everything's at the same temperature. And finally, your stabilizer can be done down at room temperature. So while it's important to make sure the temperatures are exact, you don't have to be as anal retentive as you know everything being exactly the same. So what actually happened in this case here is I used really hot water to do the blending of the chemicals. By the time I was ready to actually start processing and doing my development, my temperature, and you can see the thermometer in that bottle right there, is right out about 102 Fahrenheit. And so I just decided I didn't need to do anything, and I didn't. If I were bringing these up from room temperature, so for the next time I process, what I'm gonna do is the tub that you see there that I got on Amazon, I would go ahead and I would fill that with hot water, and I would get that as close to 102 as I could. And then you can kinda let it run, and once you get all your chemicals just at that first starting temperature, it really is pretty easy to go after that, because everything's pretty quick. It's only three and a half minutes on the developer, so it's not gonna be enough time for your chemicals to uh, cool down radically to the point where, you know, you're going to have a problem with them. So now we're on to our processing stage. And basically, it's really easy. When you're ready to go, and I used my iPhone to time everything on, but you're going to require two techniques to do these. You're going to need to know the difference in these Patterson tanks between agitation and inversion. And it's really easy. Agitation is done with a little included stick, and it's just rotating the film in the chemicals. And inversion involves putting the light tight lid on and actually turning them up and down. So what you're going to do with the developers for the first 10 seconds, you're going to agitate continuously. So it's just 10 seconds. Every time you get to a 30 second mark on your timer, you're going to invert it four times and it's just flipping it over one, two, three, four. That's all it is. So you're going to do four inversions uh, every 10 or sorry, every 30 seconds. Then you're pretty much going to do the same thing with the Blix. And once you pour that in, you're going to do the same thing. Continuous uh, agitation for the first 10 seconds. And then you're going to do four inversion cycles every 30 seconds thereafter. And this goes for six minutes and 30 seconds. One thing you also want to do with the Blix is when you do your agitation is you want to lift up the lid on the side and just burp it a little bit. You're going to get a lot of extra air build up in there and you want to relieve that when you're done agitating each time. After the Blix, you're going to do a wash phase, which basically I just used warm tap water. Um, I just did not plan this early enough, and you might get even better results if you go ahead and take one of those amber bottles, like the fourth one, and fill it with water. So that way you can get everything up to the same temperature, because this does technically need to be between 35 and 40 Celsius, or 95 and 105 Fahrenheit, and you're going to do a three-minute wash with running water. Then your final stage is you're going to use the stabilizer. And as I mentioned earlier, you could sub this out with a photo flow um, or any kind of finishing rinse that you would use on film. Uh, stabilizer is really kind of an old chemical. It's used with really early films. But since it came with the kit and I have it, I went ahead and used it. Um, and then the stabilizer is pretty easy. You can do it at room temperature. It's basically agitation for the first 15 seconds. Leave it in there for 30 seconds to one minute and you're good. Now, it's important to know that if you do use a stabilizer, you do not rinse after the stabilizer. This is your final rinse. So you literally you are going to pull it out of the stabilizer and hang it to dry. And that is pretty much it. Um, that's a mistake some people make is rinsing after stabilizer, which you're not really technically supposed to do. But I had great results. And what I did is I used film clips, hung these up, and uh, pulled them out of the reels. Hung them up for, it takes about 45 minutes to an hour for these to dry. I used the, uh, I, my bathroom, I used the shower. And the reason I do that is because you're usually running hot water daily in there. And and it gets a lot of the dust out of the air. And then it's time to cut them and scan them. And we'll go over and take a look at the images that we've got.
So I want to show you how the images came out. And what I did here is I took two rolls of film, as I mentioned on my F3, and I used the Kodak Ektar 100, which is a film that I really do love. And I am very happy with the way these came out. The Ektar is known for really nice tones, particularly deep, lush reds. Uh, the blues are really nice. Even greens show up really well on here. And it's an easy film to scan. Um, I, I used to love Kodachrome, and I was one of those people who mourned its ending. Uh, but i got to be honest, Ektar is pretty good and in some cases a better performer than, than Kodachrome was. When you scan it you don't have the red cast that Kodachrome often gave and it's just really nice and I'm very happy with the way these came out. These aren't the greatest pictures I've ever taken and in some cases here I'm kind of channeling my inner Saul leader by working with reflections a little bit but I'll go through these and kind of talk about them. Um, if you want to go download these images uh, full size as JPEGs at least and look at them for yourself I will put a link in the show notes to the, there's a little set that I made on Flickr for these and so you can go download them and goof around with them. I didn't really do much to them other than to make sure I had all the dust specs off of them and I really didn't even put much in the way of levels. Um, I adjusted maybe one or two of these very lightly. No sharpening, no sharpening even on the scan. I'm not a big fan of sharpening on the scan side. I like to be able to control that in Photoshop uh, when I scan images off of film and there's been no sharpening applied to any of these um, and it just gives a really lush, beautiful film look and I'm really happy with the way these came out in the kit. So there you have it. That is about it. That was what is involved with color film processing and if you have done black and white in the past you probably realize that this is a lot easier and a little more straightforward than just doing black and white film and if you're brand new and you're a beginner um, I actually recommend starting with C41 because it's more straightforward and there's less options and there's less room for error and and you know I know it looks like a lot of steps in here and particularly if you go back to the last episode and read through the comments um, that a lot of people have very strong opinions about how to do certain things and don't let that put you off because all the steps and all the stuff is pretty basic. Anybody can learn how to do it. And even if you kind of screw it up the first time or something goes wrong or it's, it's not perfect, then do it again because these are all basic enough steps. So really it's just learning the order and what to do and when. And it's really quite easy. Um, and it's extremely satisfying. I'm glad that I did it. Um, one thing I want to do is give a shout out real quick. Um, I got an email this week from a gentleman named Bill Thompson uh, who had mentioned that he had had experience also with a Digibase kit, which is another C41 kit that you can buy. It's available from Freestyle Photo. So I'll put a link to that below. But I appreciate Bill's input and uh, email on that too. We had a good discussion that went back and forth. Um, but anyway, check it out. Either kit you buy, just follow the directions. Um, you know, have everything prepared. Take your time allow yourself room to mess it up. It's okay. You probably won't. Um, I did way better than I thought my first time around. I'm ready to do it again. And the other thing I mentioned too is the startup cost on this might seem a little high. Because if you don't have any of the supplies, uh, you know, the spools, the tanks, the amber jars or whatever, uh, you know, there is a startup cost involved and you might spend $100 getting going the first time. But the cool part about it is that once you've done that, then all you have to do is buy the kit and the chemicals for the next eight rolls of film that you want to develop. So it's really that easy. Anyway, guys, that's been it for today. And uh, go try some C41. Go try it yourself and see what comes out and let me know what you think and how the results are. So anyway, once again, guys, this has been another episode of The Art of Photography. I'll see you guys next time. Later.